technology here get us so that we could get a, be a little more spontaneous on the interaction, but that you know, we were defeated. So anyway, let, let, let me first of all welcome this uh, um, uh, very distinguished panel that we have here. You can see from your program, you know all of them, but we I think we've covered uh, the whole field here in a sense. We have two uh, folks from the National Labs, uh, Paul and Duncan uh, McBranch, it's great to have you here. I know that Charlie McMillan was called out at the last minute, but Duncan's the, uh, in my understanding, the Chief Technology Officer uh, up at Los Alamos, so we have that perspective. Uh, we have Senator Bingaman, uh, who for many years, as you know, chaired the Energy Committee and did the oversight in this area and was the author uh, of um, many tech transfer bills and, and um, uh, also some uh, uh, oversight with tech transfer. And then one of his uh, top people, Mike Carr, who worked for the committee but then moved on into the Department of Energy. So we kind of have the, the, the whole field covered and it's really uh, wonderful to see the, the continuum here. The focus of this panel is really to identify how tech transfer policy can be improved. I mean, that's what uh, we're focusing on, the measure, uh, the regional and national impacts, the lab's focus on critical cutting edge technologies. Uh, and, and so that uh, is, is the focus of this panel. And my first question really uh, to uh, the panelists here is, what do you think, looking at successes, looking at what we've seen in the past, uh, companies that have been spun off, uh, what could we do to the process, what could we do uh, in, in terms of legislation to move us forward in terms of getting more accelerated um, technology transfer both here in New Mexico and for the nation? Well, we have to start out, and I think um, the previous panelists mentioned funding mechanisms to, to allow the labs to participate. For, for Los Alamos, our scientists are eager to participate in this range of activities, but there's a range of different uh, mechanisms that are needed. Uh, the one that we found the most powerful for reinforcing our mission as a national security lab is the collaborative research with industry, where we're jointly working on hard problems together. Uh, and then there's other programs that, that need to be targeted specifically towards startups. Um, there's a very different character, as we heard on the different panels. Um, at Los Alamos, we recognized there was a really missing um, stage of funding, which is the seed stage funding. And as part of what we've done over the last uh, seven years is the Venture Acceleration Fund we started. And it has really powerful statistics. we have put about $2.5 million in and about $48 million back. And most of that is from product revenues. And that's in 30 companies in New Mexico. They're not all lab ideas. In fact, most of them are not um, coming out of the lab. But we're working with the private sector to pick the most important um, milestones that have to be hit in order for those companies to hit success. And remarkably, 83% of those companies are still alive. And a third of them say that they wouldn't be alive without that source of funding. And so that, that's a, a special program. And then finally, the uh, New Mexico Small Business Assistance Program, which I think Paul may talk about a little bit more, was started by Sandia, and we've been able to participate that in the, in the last few years. And that's funded by the state, and it's an opportunity for the small businesses that are here in the state to interact with the labs, and uh, that's also been very impactful. And so having targeted funding that that's, uh, addresses different um, uh, types of interaction with industry I think it's more important than ever that we figure this out. For, for Los Alamos as a national security science lab, innovation is critical to our mission. And what we see is there's a shift and the, the types of threats that we face as a nation are, are changing. They're increasingly asymmetric, they're incre increasingly disruptive, and they're increasingly cruel. So we have to, we have to maintain an um, agility that, that doesn't always come naturally to a, to a laboratory of our size. Well, I uh, don't claim to be the expert that Paul and Duncan are as far as the specific programs that uh, they've instituted at the labs. I think from a from a 30,000 foot uh, perspective, though, it seems to me the the what is what they've been working to do and what, <clears throat> what we 
need to try to keep doing even better is to find ways that the, the people in the labs can, can work outside the labs when it's appropriate. I thought it was interesting that both Todd and John and the previous panel had been in the labs, now, now are outside the labs uh, trying to make things happen. Uh, so getting people physically able to move out of the labs is important. Getting people outside the labs to uh, work in the labs when there's particular projects that they think have commercial uh, promise. I think that's, that's also important. And uh, of course, uh, the, the uh, putting things outside the fence as, as the labs have worked on, Sandias uh, worked to do that. I think that allows them to maintain their uh, their national security mission and still have maximum uh, interaction with the private sector and with uh, companies that are working to commercialize uh, technology. All of those programs and all of those initiatives I think are, are very much uh, in need of being reviewed and updated and uh, maybe, maybe they can be done better and I know that's the purpose of your legislation so I commend you for, for uh, making another run at this this whole set of issues. It's very important to our economy, for sure. Well, let's see, uh, Paul Homer from Sandia. Um, you know, I would say that I put it in sort of two categories. In, in, a, in a general category, I'd say it's important that the Congress, the administration, continue to visibly support uh, a commitment to technology transfer at the labs. I can tell you, in the case of our laboratory, um, you know, we were very active in the 90s. I think we waned a little bit in the previous decade. We've tried very hard to renew that effort very strongly in the last uh, several years. We're seeing more of a pipeline there. For example, uh, you know, Todd is an example of someone who left our lab on an entrepreneurial separation from technology transfer. We've had six leave in the last 18 months. The previous two years we had none. So there's some things that we have to do now avail ourselves of existing mechanisms. Um, and that requires a, an, um, an umbrella of support, and we've had that recently from the department. Then beyond that, I think there are some specific areas that I can't speak to specific legislation, but I would put in a couple of categories. Um, first of all, uh, there's, a, there's an issue of maturing technology. Um, and we find a lot of our base technology comes out of the laboratory-directed R&D work. Uh, support for that, that allows us, and support for it that allows us to, at least at an initial level, begin to vector it towards what might have greater commercial potential. Uh, uh, certainly alignment that was talked about, I don't think alignment is necessarily our expertise, but mechanisms that allow us to interface, to get in a position where we can better understand how our technology as it matures is in a better position to the market. So things that create and support. I don't think these are necessarily large funds, but catalyst funds that support our interfacing so that we are we understand how to do better alignment will be important. Um, support long term. Todd it, it continues to support the New Mexico Small Business Assistance uh, Fund. Uh, which could, you know, I think be expanded uh, or leveraged further, is an example where we can provide continuing technical support for the inevitable challenges that uh, a startup or an entrepreneurial business faces. Um, and generally also, I think, just greater awareness uh, of the technology. We had a vignette of a small piece of technology that we've had in place for several years. We had one sort of bite on it over the last three or four years. It won an R&D 100. Or and all of a sudden the phone starts ringing off the hook. And so that's something that falls to us some, but I also think, again, some, some things that can support venues that uh, create greater awareness of the technology are also helpful. Um, so a couple thoughts from my perspective. I'm uh, within the specific subset of, of the Department of Energy, the energy efficiency and renewable energy. And um, because of that, we, our, our technologies in our suite have been uh, fairly near-term commercial now for, for uh, the last, certainly the last five years, if not the last decade. Um, and so we have uh, tried to really focus on this issue of how do these technologies uh, move out of the lab space and into the commercial 
uh, space. And there's been a, a couple of different efforts. Uh, we we um, we try to so we have I think a few lessons learned in in recent years. Uh, one we one effort we tried uh, nationwide with the labs was the Entrepreneur in Residence program, uh, which was to try to pair uh, venture funds directly with um, with labs. And and I think what what that aired act out actually was a little bit of a communications problem, uh, as, as we a little bit talked about previously, and there, there's just a cultural difference and in, in, in an inability to, to interface. Interestingly, one of the, the real success stories was LabStart, which happened here uh, at Sandia and then later at Los Alamos, um, and I think what we learned from that was being able to have not just a sort of interface with some with an outside venture firm, but someone who could really shepherd the technology you know, through the whole process, explain, had a very deep knowledge of the lab, and could explain uh, to the scientists what, what the steps really were to uh, move the technology out of the lab. And so I think uh, we saw enough of a success there that we think that we ought to try to expand that. Um, and I think that, that airs the larger question of where, where can DOE as an enterprise play? Um, I think we have found our, our best role is often as a convener, uh, bringing together um, people from, from various parts of the spectrum within the labs and, and, and without. Uh, we've done things like energy ecosystems challenges. Uh, we have an energy innovation portal to try to, to uh, reveal the technologies to the, to the wider world. All these things are sort of the basic infrastructure that we're putting together in order to uh, allow people to get access into the labs. But I think the other part of it is sending a consistent signal to our labs that we're interested in, in supporting their endeavor as they push the technologies out. It's a, it's a risky endeavor. There will be failures. Uh, and, and I think the environment in, in D.C., you know, nothing that Senator you don't have to necessarily change, uh, you know, ha has, has, I think, fostered even more of a risk aversion in recent years. And so I think we have to try to, to fill in the gap a little bit and, and, and make it clear that um, it's, you know, it's okay to fail. Uh, it's okay to, um, to scratch a little bit um, to try to solve the big problems. Uh, one of the things that I would, I would just highlight as a final remark is that Secretary Moniz and coming in, I think, has been very concerned about the perception that that DOE offices are somewhat stovepiped, and that that there is a, an, and I think in his mind, a largely artificial division between the Office of Science, which does the more basic research and, and is the primary funding source for, for a lot of our national labs, and then the more applied programs, uh, ERE being one of the applied programs. Um, and, and, and I think it does manifest even within the labs. They have large sums for very long-range problems in, from the Office of Science, and then in many cases, somewhat smaller, more targeted funds from the applied programs such as EERE. And, and I think the Secretary feels like there, there's much more of a natural uh, transition from one space to the other and they don't need to necessarily be managed entirely separately. So one of the reforms that he's undertaken uh, immediately is combining the undersecretary role. There was, there is to date, an uh, undersecretary for science and then undersecretary for the applied sciences. Combining that into one place. And I think the idea is to really align the entire R&D cycle from the beginning, from that, that basic kernel of an idea, through the lab bench into the applied programs and then hopefully out into the commercial space. And Mike, isn't it true that, that Secretary Moniz here very recently and at the highest levels of the department has set up a new office that's going to target uh, technology transfer, work with the labs around the country to try to um, coordinate on this? And I think it shows his interest in it. Is that is that? Uh, Yes, and it, I mean traditionally we have tried to coordinate from the intellectual property end, but this is this is a, an expansion of that now really into the entrepreneurial space. How do we turn these into commercial enterprises? And I, and I think it would probably be a good uh, legislative effort to complement what he's done and give some 
uh, guidance in that area as far, as far as where we think it should be headed. But the, the, the really interesting question that I think Senator Bingaman raises, I'm going to address this question to Paul and to, and to Duncan, is, is what are the obstacles, you know, it, 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 of getting outside the fence, of getting, we know we're dealing with national security laboratories, we know that much of this, uh, or, or a good chunk of it, uh, has to be held uh, uh, secretly, uh, but ha when, you, when you have, a, have an idea that you think has uh, big potential in terms of commercialization, what are the obstacles and, and how do you think we can help in terms of the Congress in, in, in uh, breaking through some of those obstacles? And then, and then uh, can the Secretary do some of that too in terms of administrative work? Well, I think I want to uh, I'll, uh, tee off of what Paul started to say that it has to be seen as more central to the mission. And so as long as it's peripheral or something that labs do on the side, uh, most all the programs that we've talked about, whether that's on you know, Resonance or Lab Start or, or uh, Venture Acceleration Funding, those are all lab funds that we invest at our discretion based mostly on royalty dollars. Um, Paul's exactly right. That those are catalyst <coughs> funds for things that are very important. So the funding doesn't have to be very large, but it does have to be seen as central to the mission. Yeah, I mean, I, again, there are, there are things that we have to do to create a climate inside the laboratory that makes sure our staff know that this is appreciated, this is valued. But we are limited in our ability. I hate to be here talking about money because I realize money is a, is a tight commodity these days. But I really do believe a small amount of targeted cap, catalyst funds that serve the purpose to both reinforce the visibility uh, of that role. And I think this is particularly true for the two New Mexico laboratories, we have fairly deep national security programs. They're very important to the country. Everybody understands that. They also are a source of tremendously innovative technology. And I think s small steps that codify, make more visible, that this role is an important role to the administration, to the, to the, to the country overall, from the Congress, and that probably does require some small amounts of dedicated funds that are probably afforded in an innovative way. I know some of the legis I, I, I did try to do my homework. I, I usually procrastinate longer than you were giving us, but uh, um, you know that, those are some innovative thinking about how to do that. And uh, I do think some of that will help us. Uh, and then a lot falls back to us to make the environment internal to the lab one that is seen as rewarding for this type of effort. But Mike, do you want to say anything on obstacles? Um, just, just briefly, I mean, I think a little bit of what I'm hearing uh, here is, is that it really is just about signaling. What, 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 what are we telling the labs and, and what kind of builds into the culture? And I think one issue, um, particularly where legislation can be very powerful on this, is that from administration to administration, priorities change, ideas change, you know, even the, the sort of the sense of what can labs accomplish or what, what does it mean to, to do technology transfer can change. Um, and so I think, you know, in, having a dedicated funding is one way to, to actually have this signaling, but also just, you know, having a legislative recognition that this is a central component of the lab mission and of the DOE mission. Uh, to turn these technologies into reality. Um, I think we have done, we've tried to do this piecemeal by creating additional agencies such as RBE or, or um, uh, the, the loan programs within, within DOE. And I think we actually now are at a place where they are beginning to align. The, the tool chest is beginning to, to fill out and that you could provide a lot of these things. I think this, this, this remains one of the key pieces is uh, giving the, the labs the direction and the certainty over time that, that they will be rewarded for trying to push technologies out. Well, you and, and you kind of hit right on my next question, and, and Jeff may want to lead with this, and the, and the rest of you um, jump in here. Um, how do you how do you uh, measure success? Uh, do you measure it in jobs? Do you measure it in economic development? Um, and, and uh, one of the, the when, when you talk about incentives, 
as we know, I mean, Lockheed it has plays a key role in terms of the management. We have a consortium with Los Alamos, with Bechtel uh, at the head, and they, there's a contract, and, and there are specific monies dedicated, uh, profit dollars, in terms of if you achieve these things, you do better. Um, are the technology, and, and I've had several people suggest to me here in the audience, and they may bring it up again, are the contract provisions adequate in terms of uh, directing and giving the right incentives to, can, to make technology transfer, and could those be, uh, could, could those be looked at uh, and strengthened? Uh, I'm not uh, sufficiently familiar with the details of the contracts to know know the answer to that. Paul and Duncan will have to answer that. I, I do think that there's been an effort over the last uh, 20 or 30 years since we've both been in Congress to, uh, to try to move our, our defense-related laboratories into a place where they are recognized as national laboratories that are capable and, and ready to, to achieve a great many missions for the nation, and of course that, that effort continues. Uh, I do think anything that the Congress can do to reinforce that perception, it would be terrific. Uh, and I think that part and parcel of that perception, if, it, if, if our labs are going to be national labs, they do have to have the part of their mission has to be working with U.S. industry and, and trying to uh, help create the economic uh, engine that, uh, or help, helping be the economic engine that we need to uh, create jobs. So uh, I think that there are things Congress can do to dedicate funds and to uh, send a strong signal that uh, this is part of the mission of the labs. And, and as far as the specifics of the uh, contracts, uh, let me leave that to Duncan and to, and to Paul. Well, the contract one can get complex, but I'll try not to get there. Uh, I think, you know, <laughs> right. I, I would say, look, um, I, I favor keeping the contractual nature fairly lean. I do believe the contract should reinforce comprehensive mission achievement on the part of the laboratories, both in the short term and stewarding their, ability, their capabilities in the long term. Going back to what we were just talking about here, to the extent that Washington in total, reinforces the importance of this component as of the mission space of the laboratories, that the contracts will already embrace that direction. Uh, so I think that, you know, I, I, I think going back, you know, reinforcing its mission place is the best way to deal with that. The one other thing I just slightly different I would um, uh, throw in is, also I think there's an important part about enabling the labs to work in New Mexico, effectively in partnership with other components of our New Mexico science and technology landscape, the university communities, etc., I do think that we have an obligation to offer back to you some innovative ideas about how to take partnership in the state further, and that that may require some support in in varying ways. That and so I do think that's an option for us also that we can do more. Uh, quite frankly, with the uh, sort of the fabric of S&T more broadly and business development more broadly in the state. Let me, let me uh, talk to some specific metrics that we look at. And these kinds of things are inherently hard because most of the metrics you pick are rearward looking and you want things that are going to forecast a little more into the future. So things like numbers of partnerships or numbers of patents are, are unsatisfactory in some ways, but they're still important. If, if, let me draw the example from the Small Business Tech Assistance Program, which has been running for about more than 10 years now. The, the fact that we have really tight metrics on that is, is absolutely vital to its continued funding. And it's the most popular tax credit in the state for that reason, because the small businesses are speaking on behalf of it. So we can point to jobs, we can point to revenues, and even more importantly, we can tell stories that involve real business owners and the impact it's had. And so I think our ability to tell more impactful stories uh, may be the most important metric. And then we look for things like impact. So for example, for our intellectual property, if 
IP is involved with the cooperative agreement with industry, it's much more likely to be valuable than if it was just invented and sitting on the shelf. And so how do you link uh, real um, deep interactions with the, with the uh, commercialization metrics and look for impact? Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, I, I do think it's important for, uh, for the national stage to trust its national laboratories. So we're uh, chartered as federally funded R&D centers and we, we care about this stuff. It's vital to our community. Um, we, we need a resilient economy in the places where we live. And so for the DOE to uh, make it easier for us to do this type of activity and then trust us to go out and experiment, um, a small amount of funding will go a long way, but you don't necessarily have to centralize the programs in Washington. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and it, you can see from the, this panel, we could spend a lot, a lot of time up here delving into this in detail, but I think the best thing to do now is, is to head out to you and to take uh, uh, questions. And uh, they're they're going to hand mics around. Why don't Why don't we go to this gentleman right back here? Yeah, they're bringing you a mic there. Uh, Kim Shanahan, the Santa Fe Home Builders Association. Thanks, Kim. Um, uh, as a hum home builder, I'm we're somewhat uh, intimidated by the brain power in this room, for sure. But I'm speaking to the idea of not being afraid to put the brain power on perhaps some humble technology. And I'm thinking specifically about where we are with solar thermal. Uh, 35 years ago, President Carter put panels on the White House, and we haven't changed the technology of those panels at all in 35 years. We've been concentrating on PV, which is exciting and certainly exciting to the labs. But Imagine that if we actually had a solar panel that instead of being four by eight was two feet by four feet, half the size. And imagine it was twice as efficient. And imagine it was a fraction of the cost of what we're paying, which really hasn't come down at all in terms of cost in 35 years. There's no reason that we should be heating our homes and heating our hot water with fracked gas and coal electricity, uh, especially here in New Mexico. So I challenge the group to think about the technology maybe we've left behind and revisit it and think about how we might be able to improve it. So, interesting to hear the comments. Well, well I'll give my uh, perspective. Uh, uh, in my view, I, I agree with you. There are some technologies that are being left behind and probably not being given enough attention. I don't think photovoltaic cells are one of them. I think uh, there's been dramatic improvement in photovoltaic cells, and particularly in the cost. Uh, cost has come down so so much that nobody can make make uh, a buck uh, producing them in this country anymore. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, there, there's also been substantial improvements in the efficiency, uh, but uh, trying to get a get to where we need to be is it's still some some somewhere uh, down the road for us, but, but I think that there's, uh, there's been st steady progress and dramatic progress in bringing down the cost of photovoltaic cells, and uh, they're not cost competitive with natural gas yet, but uh, they're close. They're getting there, and, uh, uh, and wind turbines, of course, uh, are cost competitive now in many markets, uh, many parts of the country. So uh, I, I think progress has been made. That's my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things on this. I, you know, it was interesting. You, as you were talking about this, I was thinking about actually a, a trip uh, we did to China a, a while back. And um, as you drive across that country, you'll see incredible numbers of these uh, solar thermal water heater uh, uh, installations on people's rooftops. Uh, so they're 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 very cheap there. Um, um, and I, I, I think that you know one of the points I'd make about uh, Jeff's point about how rapidly PVs have come down, particularly in the United States, is um, that has largely been a market pull uh, uh, that that has caused that that dr that dramatic ramp down. There's been tremendous market demand for photovoltaics. A lot of companies have gone in, including a lot of uh, country-supported uh, manufacturing. To really, really drive down costs and achieve massive, massive scale. Um, 
while within our solar technologies program within ERE, we do actually have uh, a thermal uh, component to it. It is um, it's been relatively small, and I would say largely due to, to that market demand imbalance. There has not been, to date, a huge market pull uh, in the United States for solar thermal. Uh, there, there have been more in Europe or in China and, and Asian countries. And, and I think for that reason, you've seen a lot of, a lot of that effort go there. Um, I, I, you know, I'd have to sort of defer to people who are really in this space to figure out if there is a, a fundamental breakthrough that anyone is, sees on the near-term horizon in thermal that, would, uh, that, could, that could make the difference. But it is a continued uh, focus of R&D. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of have to see how, how things begin to balance out as more people and I, I do think the, the potential good news is, as more people are putting PV on their rooftop, they are thinking about the energy system and the availability there, and, and you start to see some of these thermal uh, systems being integrated along with them. Um, we have, there's been some very exciting stuff, actually in the solar cooling side, using new desiccants and, and, uh, and new technologies there. So I think it's coming, I think you know, it's, it's, a, it's perhaps a little bit behind the curve, just because of where the United States market is right now. Okay, let's take our last question run over here. I'm uh, David Blivin with Cognitive Technology Fund. We're a seed stage fund based here in Santa Fe. And so a little bit from the outside looking in, um, and you've touched on this a little bit, but, um, you know, as I see it, people do what they get paid to do. And uh, so you touched on the federal contracts. But when you, when you really boil it down to, you know, are there incentives for the labs to take equity? Um, I'm not aware of any. I've talked to a number of labs. For the most part, the, most of their incentive goes towards current cash. So they tend to take advantage of their technology through Kratos, which ends up by default generally being with large corporations. Or in the fact that they might license it, um, it tends to be with the license agreements that uh, provide an upfront cash payment. And when you're a startup company, you really your primary currency is equity. And so I think having some uh, compensation structure or evaluation structure that gives credit for taking equity as opposed to taking always cash and getting, say, more value from that. When you compare the labs to the universities, Universities are very ready to take equity because they view themselves as having a long-term life, uh, you know, in theory, infinite life. But with the labs, you have short-term contracts. And so I just haven't seen the managers willing to take equity given that they're not necessarily there for the long term. So, well, maybe you can speak to that. Well, not, let me just say, I, I think that's a, an innovative thing that, that, that bears some further thinking on our part. You know, our, both Los Alamos and Sandia were, were GOCOs, were government-owned operations. Um, uh, so our flexibility in being able to take an equity position in something is not quite there. It's very different than you know a university. Some university situations exist that exist. So, but I, I do. I've had a number of my staff actually raise this issue, particularly ones who do extensive work with the university community, because they they see this difference. Up. So I, I think it's not. Uh, it's not an area uh, that I personally would uh, w categorically exclude as something we might want to think about. But it would take some innovation, I think, because the structure of the lab today doesn't lend it, as, as you well point out, lend itself to that, and there's some fundamental reasons for that. But uh, we shouldn't exclude it as something to think about. Let me just add, I, I, I'll agree with the spirit of your comments, David. And I would say we have been and continue to take equity as an alternative. Um, and uh, I don't know where, where's John? John's still over there. So, uh, John's company was one of the first that we did that, and that was a little over five years ago. And um, John helped us work through the, the way that you do that from an agreement standpoint. And so it's a it's a standard part of our toolkit now. The other thing we just did to try to make licensing easier, we just rolled out an express licensing program to make it, you know, a, a single click, uh, low cost license for the stuff that's already on the shelf. And so that was just announced about uh, three weeks ago. So we're trying to, to make the transactions easier and get more of them under the belt. Um, we've certainly seen that the, the, um, the revenue from licenses is, is a um, drop in the bucket at the labs. And so it should not be the metric for success. 
On the flip side, that is the only investment pool we have to do these kind of interesting discretionary things. And so what we'd like to do is find ways to get more technologies out there in play, not try to pick winners, but if you have more in play, more shots on goal, you can get more successes in the door. So that's what we're trying to do. Again, that, that is our only mechanism, the royalty stream mechanism, which is truly a drop in the bucket compared to the kind of funding we're talking about. I have to put it all We also have a ready-to-use license program analogous to that that uh, uh, we, we'd like to see more uptake on that. And uh, it's a little bit different issue, but uh, I think to, to be have more amplitude and inequity, it, it would require some changes because uh, the base we have for that today is pretty limited. I just make a point, just to sort of put things in context. Uh, I commend the two labs for uh, for considering uh, uh, equity as a uh, as a way to uh, help these companies. Uh, I know that there's great resistance in Washington to the government doing anything in the way of taking an equity position. Uh, I was talking to Jonathan Silver, who uh, headed the loan program and uh, was. Uh, roundly denounced for, for the Solyndra loan. Uh, uh, he also made the loan uh, to Tesla. And when Tesla paid off their loan, he said, if, if the Office of Management Budget had just allowed me to take warrants, which I, I was begging them to let me do, uh, we wouldn't have just gotten our loan paid off. We would have made a lot of money. <laughs> Very good. Very good. The, the, uh, uh, as, as you can see, I mean, we, we could go on and on here, but the, the two final points I'd just like to make. One is, is as I've uh, uh, traveled New Mexico, I've met many of these scientists that have gone outside of the fence. One example, recently, uh, a young man moved down to uh, farm and ranch country uh, near Tucumcari, and he was trying to figure out um, how, how with windmills that you could have a better technology. And he, and he took solar and, and solar water pump and combined it, uh, cut the maintenance factor down by about 10, and he's out there in an area where there's drought and there's the real need to, to keep maintenance costs down. Uh, and it's a wonderful example, and I think it's a very positive thing. I just cite one, but there I'm sure Jeff could cite many, I can cite many and travels around. So there's a very positive side of what you've done and really what this panel I think is about and what this conference is about is, you know, how do we improve upon that? How do we uh, push the envelope a little further? How do we get out there on the cutting edge? So we all thank this panel for, uh, for their contribution. I want to thank the panels. This is a great panel. We're going to have one more video from one of our other sponsors, the Regional Development Corporation. Then we have one more panel after that, and then we'll uh, break uh, break a little bit while there's a press conference. All right.